Wait a minute. Not quite. Right, so we're stream, streaming away. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning to, uh, uh, to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Paul Hodges from New Normal Consulting, and I'm with uh, Mats Wilstrom from uh, Sweden and Paul Tang from the European Parliament. And we're going to discuss, just in case you've uh, got the wrong session, but you still want to stay with us, the EU and its priorities. Mats is going to particularly talk about US-China relationships and the EU's role in foreign policy. Paul is going to discuss to say, sustainability and issues around internet regulation, particularly as these relate to Russia and China and Chinese activity. Lovely view of your partners there, Max. That's great. <laughs> so, um, so without further ado, we've we've got we've we've got the time for this discussion, which is good because it's quite an important discussion. So, what we decided to do was to ask Max and Paul in turn to speak for about uh, five minutes on their particular area. And then we'll get into a, a more of a, a detailed discussion uh, between everyone. So, Paul, I've got, I've lost, I've lost Mats, but I've got you. So why don't why don't we start with you? Thank you very much. Okay, let me. Uh, I hope you can hear me fine because my screen. I can, I, I, I can see and hear you. Okay, yeah, sorry, I, I lost, I lost I visual lost. of you, but I can still hear you. Sorry for these uh, technical hiccups. Right. Um, well, and let me take the, the topic a bit broader than uh, uh, by saying let's start with European sovereignty. What we will, see, what we have seen, in fact, since the election of the Trump administration, there's a growing sense in Europe that we need. That's a European autonomy and sovereignty. And it's one of, one of the items that uh, Emmanuel Macron has very much emphasized in his first period as a president. And uh, he will continue to do um, during his second, uh, during his second uh, mandate. Can you um, hear me? And yes, now we, we can see you. We, we had a technical glitch. We, we lost you, Matt. Uh, yes. I can't see my video, but that I tried to speak, right. but it didn't work. Yeah, and, and so we, we, okay. we started with Paul, as he was the okay. one here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. You can relax. For Since you were, uh... <laughs> so there's a growing sense in Europe that we need to have, uh, uh, we need to develop European sovereignty, and I would bring this back to the to the. Uh, this started really with the, uh, the election of, uh, of Donald Trump, but it continues. And of course, it continues also in the context where we see the, the Russian invasion in Ukraine. We see a united response uh, from the side of, of, uh, of Europe, even a bit to the surprise of Europe itself. Uh, but it also reflects that we, uh, there is, an, and I'm pretty sure that Mets will elaborate on that much more that we need to have an, uh, a common uh, uh, a common policy in Europe, not just a foreign policy, but also to make sure that we are not too dependent or are uh, over dependent on uh, autocratic regimes like in uh, like in Russia. Um, so this is the, the broad tendency that you see is developing and developing. And of course, this uh, we need uh, forms of common foreign policy, also forms of common defense policy, or at least cooperation. But it also goes into the, like I said, into the form of independence. Um, for example, um, the Commission, uh, and this has been uh, just been approved by, by Parliament and Council, uh, wants to make sure that there is screening of uh, foreign direct investment in strategic sectors. This is a change in the thinking of uh, of Europe, uh, but well, it's a broader tendency that it uh, emphasizes the the European sovereignty and acknowledges the multipolar world that we uh, that we live in. At the same time, uh, Europe is Europe, so how Europe moves forward is usually by doing what Europe is does best. That's by doing legislation, and there you see there are important areas for development. First of all, there's sustainability, and that has been given another push. 
since Europe wants to uh, become independent of Russian gas in 2000, uh, uh, 20, uh, oh, it's Russian oil in 2027. Gas is still under discussion, but there's a pu- certainly a push to uh, to become independent of Russian oil and and gas, and the discussion is mainly on when it's, uh, when it's going to be independent. But this feeds into, of course, the already agenda uh, on sustainability, and that is called the Fit for 55, which should lead to an uh, economy that is net has net zero emissions in 2050 and abides by the uh, by the idea by the by the by the the ideas of the Paris or Paris Agreement. Currently, imported is, of course, also very European. Uh, it's legislation, but it's also a market, the emission trading system. Now, we're going to have a discussion on the complement of the European major, uh, trading system. That's the uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism, which introduces a CO2 levy, you could say, a CO2 tariff at the border of Europe making sure that there is a level playing field for European and non-European um, uh, suppliers on, on the European, uh, on the European uh, market. So this is where you, what you see. On the other hand, you also see digital. Uh, digital has been a neglected area. I think the e-commerce directive was, was one of the last pieces of legislation that was in the year 2000, where... Um, I think uh, Facebook uh, and Google were, at best, it is infancy or has, has not had been initiated, and Twitter did not exist at all. So you see, and um, the, the the European Union is making progress in this area as well, especially now that in the last half year, the Digital Market Act and the Digital Service Act have been concluded, and these should provide the, the new rules for the internet and also for the social media. So here you see a very European approach on um, in areas sustainability of the economy going towards net zero in 2050. New rules for the digital world, um, also in relation to the to the big tech. But and um, but at the same time, I would like to emphasize. I think it's part of a broader tendency in Europe to emphasize European sovereignty. In this sense, and I want to have this very long introduction. It's um, Europe is good at legislation, right? So that's what it is. I some uh, Americans go to court. Europe write uh, uh, Europeans write laws. That's about, about the differences. Um, but it has the effect that it will also set have impact on the rest of the world. Is um, well known is now by now is the uh, the term Brussels effect legislation that is put in place into uh, in Europe is also have an impact on uh, on legislation or standards outside of Europe the main example being the GDPR uh, on uh, uh, which was introduced in uh, May 2018 which has set the norm for many of the uh, of the, the tech companies not with within Europe but also uh, outside Europe now in that sense, um, we also know that Europe has is made during types times of crisis. So this makes this period and this meeting also extra interesting. Uh, this is a crisis. It's uh, it's always challenging, but it's also an opportunity for change. And uh, I think it's also an opportunity for Europe to to claim its sovereignty and to be autonomous in this uh, multipolar world. I'm very curious what Matt has to uh, contribute to this. Oh, great. Cool. Th- thank you very much for a very interesting introduction there, Paul. Uh, o- over to you, Matt. Thank you. Can I speak then? Okay. Me. Yes. Okay. You hear me? I, we can hear you. By the way, can, can you see me or have I just lost the camera? I see you. Can oh, you right. See me? Oh, right. I've lost the camera here, but that's as long as you can see me, that's good. Okay. But you, you hear me anyway. Yes. Well, just to continue what, what I said, I mean, in the very present conflict ridden area where we live now, it's of course extremely important that the European Union can keep together and be co- conclusive. And I think, think that the quick response to the Russian war in Ukraine with the sanctions has shown 
a common European willingness to act. The re-election of Macron in France and a new government in Germany, which has shown a certain flexibility to deal with old positions in Germany, will give some possibilities for us to be relevant actors in the future. But to get back to what I just said here, the conflict between the US and China has emerged long before the horrible Russian war attacks on Ukraine. So how does and should EU deal with this? And first, EU is a dominating trade partner, power, and we should make use of our strong role to foster free and open trade also in a fragmented and political economic level that is fragment. And then to, to just as said we should not just relate defensively to work to position ourselves. The EU should in high tech trade in other fields, like saving of course the climate, little planet, act decisively in the multilateral field to set standards and as you said, legislation, yes, but also standards. We could do that for new products and systems for the purpose of making them globally acceptable. And we could do that. It's even more important now with the new types of service companies emerging during the pandemic lockdowns. The EU is large enough as an actor to take on such a role. We have to do it. The war has changed, of course, the conditions for global trade, the sanctions against Russia. The EU is now discussing with China and trying to prevent Chinese to become a backyard where Russian exports could escape the sanctions. But China has signed a friendship document with Russia. This is an ongoing discussion, important one though. But then, Will we then see a bipolar division where Euro Asian and Chinese power will compete with the West for dominance? I think this is not inevitable in our camp. China relies much more on the West for their own high tech development than on Russia, and especially in the field of semiconductors that are extraordinarily important for the development of high tech in many fields also for China. And China's trade with Russia is now around 147 billion US dollars. With the US, however, 756 billion, and with the EU, even 820 billion. Another reason for the view, has been taken for many, that the world will cut up between the West and the group of countries led by China, Russia, and perhaps India is the experience of the supply chain problems that have emerged during the pandemic. Many companies have not trusted deliveries of inputs to their production from the Far East. There is much talk of regionalization of supply chains and even of producing inputs back home. The evidence from many companies show that, yes, less reliance on Chinese inputs, but less of a regional alternative close to home. And more, in fact, of a still global redistribution to many different sources. That is what now creates, I think, reliability, reliability for your own production as a company. The Chinese Silk Road, eventually, is well known as ambitious with more than 150 countries involved. Around one billion dollars is invested in infrastructure. However, many countries feel the weight of a rising debt burden, as you know, and conflicts about Chinese involvement that come about in many countries. The Chinese have to learn to go forward with a certain humility. But in fact, also the European Union shows an interest in developing better and strong relations with partner countries around the world. It has taken initiatives in this direction with a so called global gateway strategy. That includes finance of 300 billion euros in investments, investments in quality infrastructure such as climate, energy, 
transport, health, education, and research and digitalization. So Europe should certainly not be regarded as being squeezed between US and China. But at this important time for Sweden and Finland, deciding on to join NATO, perhaps also a few words, finally, about this with the European ramifications. Even if security policy will be dealt with much more in depth in other panels and other systems. But so far, security policies in the five Nordic countries have been split. Second assembly, second assembly, second world war. With Sweden and Finland now joining, all the Nordic countries will have the same security policy and defense planning. Nordic defense planning in NATO, which means that with very few exceptions, the European Union will have a common orientation here. And I think this security policy adds, could add anyway, to the EU being strong and relevant also outside of the economic and trade areas. Thank you. This is what very I'm much, Matt. Paul, do you want to pick up on any of those points before we go into a, a wider discussion? Now let's kick. Let's take it to the wider discussions. I think the the, the two introductions are more or less the same along the same line. That we see a growing U European awareness of that we need to develop our common uh, approach to the outside world, right? Uh, sometimes internally driven, but for the need to, to change, uh, to, to make our economies uh, carbon neutral, but partly driven by outside events, like, of course, the invasion in Ukraine, or like I emphasized, started with the election of Donald Trump, where we realized that the transatlantic relations are not always as we want them to be. Mm. Uh, but sort of, so we see outside and inside developments leading to this, European common approach. Of course, there's always, like I said, Europe is made during times of crisis where the pressure is is at its highest, and you can see that when it comes to the sections, like uh, to the sanctions, it was a bit to the European surprise itself that we were found ourselves on a common in a uh, in a common approach. Mm. Um, then again, uh, I think this is the momentum that we see right now, and that will also continue to uh, to. Uh, to hold, given the outside pressure, but also because of the internal need for for change in the digital, it to to, be, to digitalize our economies and to make them more sustainable. Thank you, thank you very much, Paul and, and Matt. I, I mean, I think there are two elements to this discussion, uh, and I, I love the way you you said, that, Paul, that you know, Europe, somewhat to its surprise, found itself coming together so solidly. Uh, I'm sure it was much more of a surprise to uh, President Putin. Uh, but um, I think it's important. I want to come back later on to sort of internal issues, the question of whether we need a new treaty, which I saw the, uh, the German government uh, seemed to be receptive to yesterday. Uh, but if we're looking particularly, um, I want to narrow down on Internet regulation and the antics of China and Russia. How do you think Europe is doing at the moment in this area? And what do you think we should be doing, you know, in the in the near future, here, Paul? Well, my view is that. All right, that's great. <laughs> sorry, so, sorry, what? No, that's right. That's good. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, certainly, much more should be done, but the EU has the competence and and position to set new standards, also in the in the digital field, and to make those global. I mean, we should never, never underestimate the possibilities of the European Union here. We should not accept that the US and China is setting standards on their own mm. between us. And we should take, the Commission should take a real strong role here. They could do it, in my view. Right. Paul, how, you're, 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 you're one of the go to. Uh, in, in, in the digital area, what? What you now see is like a flurry of proposals uh, coming uh, from the Commission, but very much with broad support from both the Council, the Member States and the Parliament. Um, 
um, in the in the area of in, let's say in the digital uh, in the digital domain. And like I said, it was long overdue. I think there was a sort of laissez-faire policy in, uh, in on digital matters for about ten to twenty years. But we have come to realize that we have become very dependent on American big tech, um, and that has has. It's just advantages. Uh, I use nowadays an Apple iPhone. Uh, we all you can use yes. Google Gmail. So yes. It's all that, so it, it has brought its advantages, but it also has <laughs> Samsung fine. Uh, but it's it, it, it also shows that we have become uh, in a sense very dependent on, for example, social media, mm -hmm. uh, and also under, undermining our traditional media, which you see. Is for example that every euro on advertise on digital advertising spent, and uh, uh, I think it's globally, but it's also true for Europe. Every euro spent on digital advertising of 50 cents goes to Google and Facebook, mm. just showing what a dominant position they have. And you must realize that traditional media have always been very dependent on advertising. Yeah. Um, so it's not just a change from, let's say, uh, from physical newspapers to digital outlets that has led to a change in the traditional media, but it's also the fact that they have become very dominant in, uh, in this area. And that, that also leads to a discussion um, that we feel uncomfortable when Donald Trump is banned from uh, Twitter and Facebook. Do we want American commercial companies to take decisions on who and who is not allowed on the on the social media. So you see a growing awareness in Europe that we need to change that. At the same time, you could argue, yeah, but it's America, let's face it, tech is better developed in America and in, uh, in China, and up to a point that's true. But I speak a lot of uh, European entrepreneurs say, well, we don't want much. We have a lot for us going in Europe. We just want a level playing field. Yes, the, uh, this this uh, last week I spoke with uh, NDN from Proton, who is offering, among others, an encrypted email services, a company of about 400 uh, FTEs. They said, just, we just want to have a level playing field. Let us compete on equal terms. Uh, and this wow. is what is uh, one of the ideas behind the Digital Market Act, that you have specific rules for the, for the largest gatekeepers, making sure that the market dominance doesn't lead to self-preferencing and, in fact, stifles competition and innovation from startups in Europe. Mm. Uh, and the interesting part is that it's not just a discussion that we see in Europe, but also see in the U.S. Like, mm -hmm. um, you could say that Lina Khan was an, uh, appointed by the Biden administration. She became head of the Federal Trade Commit uh, Commission. Um, showing that the Biden administration is also seriously looking into the market dominance of, uh, of the big tech company. So this is a change that, uh, that it may look very European, but I think there's still alignment with, uh, with the US and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the European Union. Having said that, of course, I think the development in, the, of, in digital is very different in China, which is much more state controlled in many ways. But I think that's an approach that, uh, uh, so we now have, say, state-controlled um, tech sector in, in China, the corporate-controlled sector in Amer America and Europe finding its way forward. But in a way that I think is, uh, is going to be, uh, be, be interesting, and that start with curbing the market power, the market dominance, uh, mainly from American big tech, but also helping in this way to start new developments in, uh, for example, artificial intelligence, but also in quantum computing. Fascinating. Uh, Matt, can I switch the topic to, to the Green Deal? And uh, yeah, this is an area that, uh, that Scandinavian countries have traditionally been very strong on. Uh, we, we, we have the Recovery and Resilience Fund now in place. And it's starting to move forward. How do you think this is going to shape Europe's priorities over the next two to three in years and longer? Well, I think that it will change because so much investments are now giving priority being mm. green. And, and of course, the climate is deteriorating. We have to accept this. We have to fight it. So, of course, the European Union will have a role here. And I think also with the 
public opinion in the European Union membership countries, this will be fostered. Mm. To what extent it will then affect uh, the US and, and China, I don't know. I think, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if the fight, the bipolar fight in the US between the Republicans and Democrats will make an obstacle to such development there also. I don't know. I mean, it seems, seems to be put. Yeah. I, I, I mean, put, oh, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry? I, was saying, I mean, I, I, looking just this this week at uh, activities in the in in the Parliament, where the Parliament the Parliament this week uh, was pressing for the ending of sales of gasoline and diesel cars yes, in yes. 2035. Uh, I mean, it seems to me there's there's two aspects to this. One is that clearly there's a climate and uh, pollution uh, issue which we need to tackle. But secondly, there's also an industrial uh, activity that China is going. No, China didn't have a car industry before 2000. I think there were you know, two million cars in the whole of China. Uh, it was a bicycle economy. Uh, it's, it's still uh, only got about 300 million uh, cars, uh, the last number that I saw. So it's automatically now jumping from gasoline and diesel, where it has no chance of, of competing, to electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles, where it hopes to gain a world lead. And companies like NEO are opening up in, uh, in, in, in Norway and new technologies. So, and, and of course, the states will catch up. I mean, the states usually start slowly, as Winston, Church, Winston, Winston Churchill used to say, you know, it, it starts slowly, but once it gets going, boy, does it go fast. So uh, we seem, if we're not careful, this goes back to something that Paul was saying, if we're not careful here, if we don't move forward quickly, we will find ourselves attacked, essentially, in this crucial area of, of autos from China on one side, and the states on the other. So my question to both of you is, can we actually move forward fast enough here? Because uh, if, if we can't, I think we're going to be in trouble. Matt, if, if you could yes, hear Yes, I, I, I agree with you to what extent I could, could hear you, because it was not easy. But, of course, in Sweden, as a car maker industry, as you know, we are strongly going into this field. Germany, of course, here is sort of the motor, the, the one who decide what happens really because of the enormous in auto industry in Germany, which also spread, of course, to many of the East European countries working with Germany. So it requests, requests of course, a German change of mind in the auto industry. Uh, very much so. Yeah. And, and um, I hope it will come around. But then you have to do, ask our German friends in the Horasis more than me about that. But I would like to mention another thing about this. There's no change, changes here now. China. And with a horrible COVID situation and the so-called zero COVID mm. strategy of the Chinese leadership, there are so many small revolts everywhere in Shanghai where people are so much feeling so much insecure with their own lives and they are changing now and they are forcing somehow Shanghai to open up but I think this that could be a new sort of more grassroots led discussion in China about how to deal well, not not just with economy or, or ecology, but with the whole type of society that you live in. That you have to move more to the grassroots, and then, of course, also being to accept more of ecological concerns, including, of course, fossil fuel and cars than before. I don't know. I don't know if on this, but I. What I see in Shanghai, I think, can change some 
important things in, in the grassroots. Uh, you're, you're more optimistic than I am, but you're, you're a young man, Matt, so you're allowed <laughs> to be optimistic. <laughs> not, so, not so young. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, how do, how, how do you see things? No, uh, yeah, well, I, 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 your question is uh, very pertinent. Uh, how much time do we have? And, and, and usually, I would say, when it comes to sustainability, uh, 28 years, is it a long period or is it a short period to reach, uh, to reach uh, net zero in, uh, in 2050? Uh, sometimes I, I, I feel a bit uh, scared by the idea that we have to make this change in 28 years in many areas, right? It's not just... It's not just cars, it's also changing the heating in our homes, for example, or uh, building uh, enough uh, windmills to have, uh, to have wind energy. So it sometimes needs to be at a breathtaking, uh, needs to be at a breathtaking pay, pace, especially when you compare it to the past. On the, on the other hand, like I said, we were... We are gearing towards an economy where every incentive is to change. Mm. And so what I find interesting to see is, take for example the CBAM, uh, the mm. Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or the Carbon Levy, uh, the Carbon Tariff if you want. When it was first introduced by the Commission, this idea, and the idea is of course is not old, but when it was put forward in a, in a, a legislative proposal by the Commission, the initial reaction of John Kerry was rather negative. I remember that, yes, last year, yeah. Um, I, my, my colleague, Mohamed Shahim, is a rapporteur uh, of the European Parliament on this file, and he has traveled uh, on several occasions to the US, and he sees a growing interest in the side of mm. the Congress on the CBA, because, well, on the one hand, uh, because also, in the US, the awareness is growing that there, we need, there is a need uh, for a change towards sustainability. On the other hand, because the US also realized that given that uh, they uh, have more and more introduced gas as a way to, uh, to, uh, to warm houses and to fuel the industry, they are not in, a, in that bad position. But it will have an impact, for example, on China, no doubt about it. So do you see, that, again, this this change, what Europe needs to do to incentivize the, the players in the economy to make the change towards sustainability, mm. will also have important ramifications for the world economy. And, and I think in this sense, US is in a much better position than China mm. uh, to, uh, to compete. Uh, and I personally believe that this will also prove to be an advantage for Europe. Uh, Maybe not in the probably not in the short run, especially if we want to become independent of Russian oil and gas in the short run. We could then yeah. resort to the old means like uh, a bit more coal. Um, but in the longer run, I think it will be a tremendous push and mm. uh, is uh, at least giving European Union leadership in, uh, in the area of sustainability and all the sustainable technologies. And that will also drastically change the the. Uh, well, the the, the the relations in the world economy. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Franz Timmermans has been very strong on that, and I think he's he's got it absolutely right. Matt, Matt how, how how do you how do you see this? Well, I would avoid having a sort of competition between the U.S. and the European Union, uh, being the first or so, or second. We need the transatlantic cooperation much more now, now than before. And in fact, uh, there are possibilities of developing this. There is this, this transatlantic technology council between the European Union and the United States, where sort of a common solution, the new high technology field should be evaluated by the companies and the, and the administrations and that could lead it must be, but could lead to a better transatlantic cooperation on high technology fields and that is what we need we need it and the americans need so, so in my mind we should work much more for the transatlantic cooperation and really 
pinpoint those companies and those parts of the administrations in both the European Union and the US. Oops. Yeah, yeah, you're you're breaking up a bit. Will it? I'm afraid a bit there. Oh, we've lost him. But, uh, right, hello, Paul. Hello. Yeah. Okay. There's Matt. Matt sometimes returning. Um, the question, of course, is I, 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 of course, I agree with Matt that we want to have a strong transatlantic relation. But this is why I started my introduction referring to Donald Trump. What you see in the U.S. and what you also see in the European uh, countries is a polarization in society. Mm. And so when we come to discuss transatlantic relation, the question for Europe is, with which America is it? Um, and that is a cause for concern, at least from the European side. Um, after Trump came Biden, who will be come after Biden? Will it be Donald Trump or one of his successors? Well, then it's going to be hard to develop this transatlantic situation. I don't think this period has been really forgotten. It's still in the in the minds of the European uh, that we need to um, cannot become too dependent on the transatlantic cooperation that we need to develop European sovereignty. Uh, and I think that is, even though we welcome, of course, the, the, the different, the co cooperative attitude of the Biden administration, I think it has been helpful, for example, in also making the global deal on taxation, including the minimum effective tax rate. Mm. Um, uh, we st I think there's a uh, very clear in the European mind that we need to develop this European sovereignty uh, uh, more and more in a multipolar world. Yeah. And I think the Russian invasion in Ukraine only underlines that, that we uh, we are not sure that, uh, that there will be this global community, so to say. Not yeah. sure that we doubt whether there will be this global community. And then we need to find strength, both economically and uh, in foreign policy and military to, uh, to in, this, uh, in, in, this, in this world. Yeah. Can I, 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 I think that really, irrespective of it will be Biden or Trump as leaders of the United States in Congress and presidency, we should point, pinpoint those companies in the high technology field that understand that cooperation with European high technology companies is very important and to, to commonly develop high technology solutions in new fields. In those fields, what are all no, no, no longer, not longer, but well, no yet any barriers, barriers to trade. In those high technology fields, we should cooperate together on fire solutions. And there are enough of such possibilities not to be <laughs> forgotten. And I think that is one way for us, for us to work with the United States, irrespective of the political leadership. Right. Can I, we've got about five minutes left. Uh, can I bring you back round now to Europe's own sovereignty issues and the idea that uh, President Macron has floated of a new treaty, which I saw the uh, the German government uh, seemed to be uh, willing to, uh, to to consider last night. Uh, and certainly, you know, we've seen in Europe that there are divisions, just as there are in the, in the states. Uh, do you think it's the right time for a treaty revision, uh, sort of, you know, ten ten years or so after Lisbon? Uh, do you think this is an important issue for? Uh, for, for Europe to address at the moment? Paul, you're, you're involved in the well, parliament. Yeah. Personally, I, I, of course, personally, I think it is. Um, we need to think about uh, the rules of our community. Um, we see how important it is if Europe is united uh, when it comes, for example, to put pressure on Russia and to helping Ukraine. Uh, and it just shows that we need also a common foreign policy to start with. And that is, at this stage, uh, not possible. But it's not just foreign policy. I just mentioned uh, taxation. Currently, Poland is blocking uh, the EU directive on a minimum effective tax rate. 
potentially jeopardizing the global deal. Mm. Right. So this is not. We all know that this is uh, unanimity in some of the areas like foreign policy, taxation, fighting international crime and ter- uh, terrorism. Uh, is hampering Europe in its progress. Mm. And uh, I think we should at least should have this the discussion. Uh, I know that changing the treaty will be long drawn out processes, difficult uh, to achieve a result. But personally, I think we should start anyway, because I think it's important to have that discussion. You can't have a community and not discuss what this community is about. Right. Uh, that's, uh, but I... I, of course, I admit the the outcome of this process is going to be uh, it's going to be difficult. Just one reminder, because we also want a Europe that is um, not playing lip service to democracy, and the European Union in itself is still very much has sometimes this intergovernmental characteristics, mm-hmm. which doesn't bring it close to uh, the ideal of our democracy. So I. But hey, I say this as a member of European Parliament. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I think you still... enough folks, didn't you, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think I yeah. still think it's sometimes for the general people, the European Union is relatively incomprehensible, and it is not just let's better explain it. It's simply too complex to uh, to explain. So once you're inside it, once you're inside the bubble, you get the understanding. But I don't understand my mother to understand it. But she has to go to the ballot box, mm. right? And this is where you see, still see the disconnect between the European Union and the, and the people, and that concerns me. So I also, and this is one of the reasons why the European Parliament started it. We always have to push the the, the procedure of the Spitzenkandidat, who will be the, the, mm. the president of yes. the commission. Of course, this backfired last time when yes. von der Leyen was chosen. But I think we need some form of democracy so that people know that when they go to the ballot box, they know what they vote for. And that is still lacking in, in Europe. And that is, in the long run, um, uh, to the detriment of the, of the European development. Yeah. I, I mean, I, all I'd say is uh, that you know, as, 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 an, as, as an Irish passport holder living in Portugal, I think in both countries, the idea of Europe is incredibly important. And, you know, we, we may get other bits wrong, but we've got that bit right. Uh, Matt, we've got a minute or two. I'll give you well, the, the final, final word uh, to, as our, our the, great statesman here. The Swedish <laughs> view you. is, I think, that we don't need new treaty changes. We should make use, which we haven't, we haven't done yet, of the Lisbon Treaty change. And there's a lot to do with the Lisbon Treaty changes. And, and rather go into direct new areas, new legislation within the treaties. Uh, and, and we need reforms in that direction and to democratize Europe, of course. And perhaps what has made this year with the dialogue with the people, it's not enough. We could co- con- have to continue that also. But basically, no treaty changes because we need to do so much within the Lisbon Treaty already. But then again, uh, Mats, if Sweden, if Sweden can join the NATO, you can also maybe discuss treaty changes in the European Union, right? So nothing, nothing is <laughs> yes, always, always discuss it, of course. But we don't think yeah. we think more direct action. <laughs> I, I was sure you'd make that point at some time, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much. It's been a fascinating and important discussion. Really, uh, really a privilege to uh, to chair it. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Matt. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you.